Welcome to this webinar of the Wider Europe Programme um, of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, my name is Marie Dumoulin. I'm the director of the Wider Europe Programme. Um, and I'm happy to host this discussion um, about Russia's outreach to the so-called Global South and how the West can address this. Um, this issue um, of Russian engagement with the Global South is not new. It has been, there has been an ongoing competition for influence in um, the so-called Global South uh, between Russia and Western countries uh, for some years now. But with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the um, intensity and the nature of this competition has um, somewhat shifted. Um, Kadri Lik, who is a senior policy fellow with the Wider Europe Programme um, of the CFR, has authored a policy brief um, called From Russia with Love, um, Russia's, uh, how Moscow co uh, courts the global south, sorry, um, last December. And she's joined today uh, by Hannah Nutte, who just published, uh, who is the director of um, the Eurasia non Proliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies um, and a well-known um, expert of uh, Russia foreign and security policy. So Hannah Notte um, just published with Michael Kimmich um, a paper um, on ca containing global Russia, which um, also discusses the same um, kind of issue. Um, and they are both joined by Ivan Krastev, uh, the chairman of the Center for Liberal uh, Studies in Sofia and currently in Oxford, St. Anthony's College, right? Um, so we have a good, I think, um, range of speakers. Maybe we start with you, Kadri, to just sum up the, the findings of your research um, and, and take it as a basis for our discussion. So Kadri, please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you for uh, joining us today for that discussion. Mm. Well, I am a lifelong uh, Russia watcher. So also my my view on the global self um, is largely in, in that context. I view it through the Russia lens. Um, <clears throat> and I, I have tried to look at Russia's outreach towards the non-Western world, even in a somewhat historical perspective. And what emerges is quite a neat periodization um, into three fairly distinct periods uh, of post-Soviet Russia's outreach to global, um, global South or, or non-Western world in general. And I would argue that for 20 years, 1992 until uh, 2012, uh, Russia's outreach to the rest of the world was actually subordinate to its relationship with the West, first and foremost with the United States. It used the leverage it had elsewhere to manage its relationship with the West. Um, I think Russia's interactions with Iran, for instance, are, are a perfect example how, how Russia cancelled or restarted its arms sales to Iran, depending on where it stood with Washington, whether it wanted to pressure Washington or please Washington. Um, I don't think Iran liked it particularly, but, uh, but for Russia, that was a workable approach during that period. Then, however, things changed in 2012, when Putin came back to presidency and he returned a changed man. Um, he had been trying to find Russia a place in the Western-centric world system during his first two terms in the Kremlin. Um, that experience, and probably also the experience of Medvedev, had convinced him that this is not possible at least not in the way he had hoped. And his policy outlook was different when he came back. He redefined Russia, not as a Western power in a political sense, but as, as something else. And all its non-Western relationships, they were no longer subordinate to the West the same way, but they became ends in, in, in themselves. 
Russia started cultivating our relationships to be used as leverage if, if and when needed. And I remember that when, I mean, Russia's expert community, even at the time after between 2012 and 22, they were a little bit worried that if a new, new reset or a new fall with West <clears throat> is, is, is proposed by some Western capital, Will we ditch all the uh, goodwill we have built up in places like China or Iran? I never thought there was a chance of that happening. I mean, Russia's strategic outlook had, had changed as defined by, by the Kremlin. And then another change happened in um, 2022, uh, when everything became subordinated to the war needs. And that also is a shift of policy, not necessarily to Russia's advantage, in my view, has always been that in early 22, Russia had everything it, it needed. Um, it was in talking terms with both Beijing and Washington. Um, it used uh, that leverage to its advantage. It, it was building up relationships in, in many other parts of the world. Um, it had learned to use military force for political ends better actually than, than Western countries. So I was kind of reluctantly even impressed because it seemed to me that Russia was finding its feet in its new role as no longer uh, Soviet Union. And, you know, in historical terms, that was happening remarkably quickly. If you look at adaptation periods, some other former empires have taken. Mm. And then, of course... Uh, Putin started war in Ukraine, and that changed it. Not only became it evident that Russia was actually not adapting so well, but it also actually changed its its outreach um, to the West, to the rest of the world, and and its possibilities. So everything became yeah subordinate to war needs. So that meant Russia needed actually non-Western partners uh, to buy weapons from to sell its raw material to, um, <clears throat> and also to, to cultivate world trade system that circumvents the West, also circumventing dollar, facilitating trade that is not uh, vulnerable to Western sanctions. All these things became <clears throat> important. Uh, that is having effect on Russia's former policies and I think that effect could actually even increase as, as time passes. Russia is reviewing some of its former policies. I mean, for instance, a nuclear deal with Iran, that's not on the horizon right now. But even if it were, I don't think Russia would be cooperating on that, even though GCPOA was one of the things that actually survived annexation of Crimea. The West and Russia kept talking on that. That is dead now. There is even talk in Russia about sanctions on North Korea. You know, should should Russia facilitate North Korea's nuclear program? Um, that's not a done deal because you know North Korea sanctions are UN imposed. Russia has voted for them. Seat in the UN is something Russia uh, considers important. So, but the mere fact of discussion is is also uh, interesting. And in general, I mean, <clears throat> the strategic stability, Russia has made it quite clear in recent days that it's not willing to discuss strategic stability with the West, while the West is helping Ukraine in this conventional war against Russia. So you know, compartmentalization that Russia used to favor, even historically as a Soviet Union, now they do not want that anymore. And furthermore, Russia has become a lot more ideological. Uh, they, now it is really crusade against the West. I mean, earlier it was not. I remember making the argument myself that you know the West might think that everything Russia does is is directed against us. Um, it's understandable why we might see its actions that way, but not all of them necessarily are. Sometimes Russia just minds its own business, um, <clears throat> and and even though we might not like its policies, it doesn't mean we are the target. Now I could not say that anymore with, in the same way, because I think now the situation is that for Russia to win that war in any meaningful way, it actually also means that the role of the West in the world needs to become diminished. 
because otherwise the West would always keep Russia as a sanctioned pariah state. To, to emerge from that war with an international status that is comparable to what it was before the war, Russia actually needs to deal a blow to the West. And that is why, I guess, we see Putin's speeches that are really, they echo Brezhnev. I even compared the two, and they, they are interchangeable. He's trying to use all well-known rhetorics, um, anti-colonialist, uh, anti-Western hegemony to, to recruit friends in, in global south. Question, of course, is whether that is sign of strength or weakness. I'm also inclined to think that um, our idealization is a sign of weakness because Russia is not in the position necessarily to offer other things to these countries in the way it could before the war. Its possibilities have become constrained. Uh, but but nonetheless, it is it is it is very focused on on that. And yeah, I I try to also conclude by asking how should the West think about it. Um, it is of course not a battle of narrative. I think now we are realizing it that it's not enough to uh, travel to non-Western countries and explain them uh, why why they should side with Ukraine rather than, than Russia. Um, they, they mind their own business. They don't want to become pawns in another um, Russia-West contest that they remember very well from, from the Cold War. And and then the world has changed. These countries feel they, they need more agency and actually they are, they have right for it. They are, we are well equipped for that. So, I think for Western policy, if we if we want to rely on these countries' support also when it comes to Ukraine, our policy should get a lot more transactional. Um, transactional in a good way. I mean, there is transactional and there is transactional, and not all of it is bad. Um, but this also the good one is it's actually hard for us because of how our societies are constructed. Our societies are also polarized, very emotional and full of activist groups who would always find things to criticize if a prime minister or foreign minister wants to go out and conclude some kind of a deal with some country out there that surely doesn't correspond to all the standards of, of democracy. So it is it is hard hard adaptation for for us as as well, and overall, of course, I think we're stopped in in the global south. And excuse me, I keep using that term. I I I, I know all its shortcomings. That's really a placeholder here. Um, I think we're stopped as to to what extent you know what's going to become of the West. To what extent the West will stay a power to be reckoned with and i think it's also equally important that we make our democracy work at home that we manage to adapt to the world as it is changing and if they say that if they see that we are we are there to stay that will actually affect their calculations as well as russia's uh better than anything we might say as in our battle for narratives hearts and minds i'll finish here Thank you very much, Kadri. Um, and, and thanks again for the for the interesting research you published um, in December. There is one point on which I think Hannah and you diverge um, in the in the interpretation of this Russian outreach to the global south. Um, what or and, and the consequences for the West. You are basically saying um, that for Russia to win that war, the role of the West needs to be diminished. So this competition with the West is a consequence of, of the war. And Hannah, if I understood correctly your article in War on the Rocks, you see the war as part of an effort to overthrow the Western-led global order. Um, 
so tell me if I'm wrong in seeing a divergence here. Um, and maybe also if you can reflect with us on the strategic, strategic dilemmas this situation is creating for the West. Um, I think that would be great. So Hannah, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie, and thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you all today. Um, and I greatly enjoyed reading Kadri's, uh, Kadri's report. Um, to your first question, Marie, I'm not sure Kadri and I diverge so much. I mean, what, what Michael and I say in the piece that you kindly referenced in your introduction is that we should understand the war in Ukraine as part of a broader contestation between Russia and the West over global order, that this war for Russia is not just about Ukraine, and it's not even just about uh, a claim to a sphere of influence in Central or Eastern Europe. It's really it's really about global order, about the rules of the game in international politics. Uh, Putin has been set on a revision of global order for, for quite some time. Um, proclaiming the advent of true multipolarity of a of a more just and an equal global order, and of course he has to stand firm in Ukraine if this Russian project uh, is to succeed. But we can sort of we can come again to what that would actually mean Russia succeeding because I think that's an interesting question. What does Russia actually have to put forward by way of a positive vision or agenda for global order? I think that's a, that's a big question. But let me come to your question about the strategic dilemmas that Russia's outreach to the global south is creating for Western states. And, and let me go through a couple of those dilemmas quite concretely. The first dilemma here is what I would call isolating Russia versus ensuring functioning multilateralism. I think what we've seen since the invasion of Ukraine is that Western states have, on the one hand, wanted to isolate Russia internationally and really to forge a, a, as broad as possible an alliance against Russia. And certainly in the immediate post-invasion period, this was a priority and it extended into multilateral fora. But on the other hand, Western states have of course viewed the maintenance of functioning multilateral institutions as important and have wanted to prevent these institutions from fully getting paralyzed um, and bogged down in, in politicization and paralysis, given this uh, confrontation with Russia over Ukraine. And um, let me just give you an example of, of where this has uh, played out and what Western states have done about it. Um, I looked at the impact of the Ukraine war on multilateral nuclear fora last year in a research project. So the kinds of fora that deal with nuclear disarmament uh, issues. Um, and, and the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. So think the IAEA, the UN First Committee, the NPT process. And what you see in those fora after the invasion of Ukraine is what countries from the global, so uh, global South called a procedural earthquake. You know, there was excessive politicization, lots of rights of reply. So Russia and Western diplomats getting bogged down in, in these rights of reply over Ukraine, an increased tendency towards voting and um, interviewing diplomats from the global South um, what they would say in terms of how they felt um, being put in this position at these multilateral fora were things like frustration, being uncomfortable, being felt like they were put in the middle. And it, it felt like they were mostly blaming Western states for the state of affair, not so much Russia, because it was Western states who approached them um, to sort of take a side over the war in Ukraine. And these states would... Um, uh, would say that they have an aversion to name and shame. Um, and that is a historical position that they have adopted in these fora. And that's how they explained uh, being reluctant to, for example, um, single out Russia over its various nuclear actions, whether it's nuclear threats or the deployment of nuclear weapons to Belarus or the more recent de-ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And of course, they would point to precedents of what they saw as irresponsible Western action. For example, President Trump's uh, nuclear rhetoric, you know, fire and fury vis-a-vis -vis North Korea to sort of say, well, we didn't single out other countries, so we're not going to single out Russia. But great frustration with the state of affairs. Now, the way Western states have tried to deal with the situation is to somewhat depoliticize those issues again in, in nuclear fora, uh, come up with some creative solution. And I'll just give you one example. 
the the general conference of the IAEA in 2022, so immediately after the invasion, was really quite politicized and the atmosphere was very toxic. And different technical resolutions got bogged down in, in voting because of the Ukraine issue. So the year subsequently, in 2023, Western states took the Ukraine issue and put it in a new resolution, so sort of compartmentalized it in order to depoliticize the technical resolutions that get usually passed at these at these uh, general conferences. This is just sort of by way of one example of a dilemma that has been created. I'm sure we could extend this to other multilateral organizations. The second dilemma is what I would call, and, and, and Kadri has actually hinted at this already in her remarks about the need for a more transactional approach. It's the dilemma between maintaining Western standards on the one hand, versus preventing Russia from filling certain niches in the global south. Now, this is a dilemma that precedes the war in Ukraine very clearly. If you look at the kinds of niches that Russia fills as an economic partner to countries in the global south, you know, there's only a few really to mention. It's Russia as a provider of weapons. It's Russia as a country that builds nuclear power plants. Uh, uh, offering very attractive uh, models uh, to countries like Egypt, for example, or Turkey, where Ross Atom is building nuclear power plants, now trying to make an entry into the African continent as well. And I think the, the thing to note here is that oftentimes countries for weapons or for nuclear power plants that don't necessarily go to Russia because it's the partner of first choice, but because they feel they don't get from the United States or Europe what they want, because there's the requirements are too onerous. Uh, there's uh, considerations related to human rights, of course, or other other considerations. And you know, it was interesting hearing the, the German defense minister uh, Pistorius reflecting on this problem at the at the recent Munich Security Conference, where he was reflecting on Russia's recent inroads into the Sahel zone, and and he was saying, and I quote Pistorius here. If we refuse to cooperate with certain African states because they do not fully meet our standards, our values, then Russia will step in, usually not for the good of the country or the stability of the region. Well, what will we have gained then? Not much, to be honest. So this is this is another dilemma I see. But again, it's it's not fully new. And then the third dilemma I would call, you know, how does the West prioritize in light of multiplying crises that we see around the world, some of which are fueled by Russia's actions in the global south. And, and let me explain what I mean here. If I look at Russia's engagement with the global south, I sort of broadly see two categories of states that Russia deals with. A lot of those states are you know, countries that engage with the West, that engage with Russia, countries that are reluctant to be caught up in this binary, as, as Kadri put it. And then there's a small subset of states that are openly hostile against the West, Iran, North Korea, Syria, a number of others come to mind. And what you see Russia doing um, in light of the war against Ukraine is actively enabling and emboldening those countries. Kadri has gone into it a little bit, talking about Russia's relations with North Korea and with Iran, where Russia has, you know, gotten support from those countries, but it is also giving those countries something in return. And I think you can make a good argument that both Pyongyang and Tehran have probably an enhanced appetite for risk now and feel more emboldened in their respective regions because they're aware of their increased utility uh, to Russia. And what that does, I think, is creating new sources of tension or problems for Western policy in different parts of the world, on the Korean Peninsula, in the Middle East, while we also still have the situation, of course, in Ukraine. And I think that is part of Russia's strategic intent. If we think about the war in Ukraine as being one about, as being a, a broader confrontation over global order, I think it suits Russia very well to have these sort of metastasizing pressure points for the West emerging in different parts of the world. And of course, we only have so much bandwidth and our publics only have so much desire for, you know, for, for, for us to get involved to deal with all of those issues. So that is creating an additional dilemma. Um, I have a few other ideas, but let me end here perhaps, and we can come back to some of this in the discussion.
I'm sure we can come back to this in, in the discussion. Uh, just before we move to Ivan, um, I'd like to tell our audience that if they have questions, they can use the QNR, uh, Q&A um, box um, of Zoom to ask them, and I will, um, I will uh, make sure that they are answered. Ivan, you've been looking at um, the public opinion in Europe, but also in a number of um, of countries. Um, and I, if I wanted to ask you, based on what you know from the public opinion in these countries, but also from what on, on what we've heard by Kadri, that it's not a question of narratives. And what Hannah described about the mistakes that the West have has been doing and the dilemmas um, that um, that the war creates. Um, how can we deal with these issues? How can the West engage with the global South in a way that um, that is not counterproductive, to put it um, simply? Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, privilege uh, uh, speaking after Kadri and Hannah, who know much more than me on the topic. And I'll start with uh, two things that both of them kind of uh, underlined. Uh, Russia policy and kind of a turn uh, to the what you call global south did not start with the war. And from this point of view, now if you see also some of the Russian publications after the war, total focus on the West is now estimated in the Russian government circles as the biggest mistake of the Russian uh, uh, foreign policy. But also because of the fact that it was so much focus on the West, while well, Soviet Union used to have all these networks and relations with different countries uh, in uh, outside of the West. Interestingly, as a result of it, basically part of these relations have been privatized. So it was very much private companies and others that have relations with the previous uh, Russian clients, uh, Soviet clients. Uh, and as a result of it, this, by the way, also explains the fact that when it comes to the relations with the rest of the world, on the Russian side, quite often outside of the narrative, you're going to have a very strange actors. Listen, Wagner being the major player on Africa and so on. This is the result of the fact that to a great extent, uh, uh, the Soviet legacy was privatized, uh, and not the state, but a different kind of uh, non-state actors have been using it. Secondly, and this is very much where uh, uh, Hanna was uh, 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 going, is that when the war started, for many in the West, and particularly in Washington, the idea was that this is a great opportunity to mobilize public opinion in defense of international order. And you came with the framework of democracy versus authoritarianism. And basically the idea was that uh, Russia is uh, the major enemy of the international order. And this strategy didn't work. And it didn't work for a very simple reason. Uh, many things that we are calling order for many of these countries was perceived disorder anyway, or Western domination. And it's not by accident that Russia borrowed uh, the language of hypocrisy, of Western hypocrisy, which is the dominant discourse on this. Secondly, while in the West, and particularly in Europe, we were really scared by how much this war is uh, changing the world. For many other players, and not necessarily anti-Western players, there was an opportunity. And you can see it in Turkey, you can see it in Brazil. Uh, many of these middle powers, they're trying to assert themselves. And as a result of it, not simply that they didn't want to take sides, but they're seeing this really as a possibility to put on the agenda things that were very interesting for them. So my first argument is that basing our relations with a non-Western world on the Russia's war in Ukraine is not a great idea. Uh, the West should be able to help Ukraine without believing that this is uh, basically the job of the world. Uh, and the more we're making Ukraine critical for our relations with other countries, the more we're going to be in a weaker position. From this point of view, talking about the positive examples, the country that got it totally right, how you can help Ukraine using the resources outside of the West, in my view, was the Czech Republic. Uh, the Czech initiative to basically buy ammunition, and they were very successful for this, uh, 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 and uh, try to help Ukraine by buying ammunition outside of the West, was done not through a kind of a moral lecturing and not basically talking in terms of value wars, but basically using the contacts of the Czech companies that had been selling these Soviet weapons to all these non-Western countries for most of the Cold War. <laughs> 
So in a certain way, there is a certain resources that could be mobilized. But I don't believe that ideological frame in which we were trying to do it was acceptable for these countries. Uh, secondly, uh, believing in the, uh, I also very much agree with Kadri that uh, because of the fact that we didn't manage to isolate Russia, now we try to see Russia as slightly more successful than it is in the relations with uh, the rest of the world. Uh, because it's one thing your major narrative uh, to prevail and talking about the public opinion, uh, the Russian narrative is dominating non-Western world. People believe that the war between Russia and Ukraine is a proxy war between the West and Russia. The only people in our survey who do not believe it is Europeans, Americans, and South Koreans. Uh, but at the same time, this is not what defines their relations to the West. And also, uh, uh, it's very important that uh, the war in Gaza and basically what is happening in the Middle East also dramatically reduce the possibility of the West to keep the discourse with which it started. This attack on devil standards, the fact that for some countries, the real global uh, conflict is in the Middle East and not in Europe is critically important. In the first three weeks of the war in Gaza, the social media activity on Twitter was four times higher than in the first three weeks uh, in uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine. So while we started with the idea that the Russia-Ukrainian war is a global event. Now we are much more realizing it's very much European war, regional war, very important for Europe. And by the way, it can have a dramatic implications on the future of European Union. But this is not the war that keeps sleepless many in the world. And by the way, Russia is also much uh, uh, diplomatically and in commercial times weaker uh, because while the Russians were very much pushed to try to create a network in order to buy things that they cannot buy like before, uh, this is not the type of relationships which you're creating a major infrastructure. And by the way, the fact that their relations with the non-Western world was privatized and some of them quite corrupt schemes helped Russia. Uh, in a certain way, having a kind of a smuggling channels from before uh, helps, you, helps you in the moment of war. So some of uh, Russia's weaknesses... Uh, has become Russian strength. But at the same time, keep in mind, a country like Turkey has much more diplomatic missions around the world than Russia. In a certain way, in its relations with the rest of the world, Russia continues to be a regional power, which has, of course, global legacy, which is doing uh, things which are important for some of the countries. By the way, our sanction regime put Russia in a better position with some of the countries, particularly India and others, because they were delivering on the discounted uh, rates to these countries. Uh, but at the end of the day, the major competition of the West in outside of the West is not with Russia, but with, with China. Uh, and from this point of view, it's quite important to keep the proportion and the scale. China can provide money. China, in a certain way, can provide model. And Russia, on its side, benefited both by being the inheritor of the Soviet Union and not being the Soviet Union. Uh, so they inherited certain type of networks, people who get an education in the former Soviet Union, people who speak Russian, people that had been supported by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union during the anti-colonial wars. But on the other side, Russia is exporting not a real ideological model. There is not a kind of a success. It's not China. So as a result of it, nobody really fears them in the way Soviet influence was feared by certain important groups in the Western societies. And plus, Russia now is much more going with the idea of sovereignty, conservatism, and so on, certain things that basically looks like uh, scary. Where I do believe that Russia, in a certain way, really were hurt uh, by the war and their relations with the rest of the world is First, because in many parts of the world, starting with Asia, Russia didn't want to be perceived simply as a China bright. Uh, for them, relations with countries like India were critically important. Even in Africa, Russia was trying to position itself as the third power. If you don't want to choose between China and the West, come with us. This type of a game is not possible anymore. Uh, the dependence on China economically and others is critically important and what both uh, Kadri and Hanna said, in my view, the most important strategic kind of relationship that Russia was forced to develop as a result of the war or the relations with uh, North Korea, but particularly with Iran. Uh, but the moment you're developing this relationship, of course, you're also losing friends. You're losing some friends in the Middle East, which are particularly not uh, keen on Iran. Uh, you're creating a much more uh, difficult relations with uh, 
Turkey. So from this point of view, uh, the major success uh, of uh, the Russia policy outside of the West very much is going uh, to be based on the fact to what extent they're going to be able, like before, to compartmentalize different relationships, to basically keep uh, kind of uh, the, the strategic partnership very much limited. Because this big ideological coalition on the anti-Western base, I don't believe it is going to work in the way basically it works in the speeches of President Putin. Not that many of these West, non-Western countries are in love with the West, but they have been quite much more pragmatic and in a certain way, they're much more following their own interests. They're going to end up on the EU because the difficult problem of the EU is that in a moment in which all others are much more trying to adjust to disorder and try to how to benefit from it, we do not have a language to speak like this. We speak order even when we're not sure that the order is still there. Uh, and as a result of it, kind of, uh, otherwise everybody said, let's engage on the issues that are very important for these countries. I do believe it's much easier for this to be done uh, by some of the member states in the European Union uh, and much more difficult uh, to be done uh, by the European Union as an actor. So this is not by accident that uh, Czech Republic did it. And it was much more difficult both for Brussels, but also for Paris and Berlin to do it. From time to time, to be small helps you. Thank you very much, Ivan. And thank you also for highlighting that the current situation creates dilemmas, not only for the West, but also for Russia itself. And that's what we see with the war in Gaza. Um, Hannah has been looking at how the engagement with um, Palestinians and with Arab countries has been probably damaging the relationship between um, between Russia and, and Israel. And Kadri, you'd been looking at the changing relationship between Russia and China um, before the war, but obviously this relationship has changed in, the, in a way that creates uh, new dilemmas for Russia. I have three first questions, uh, which I will ask to the panelists, and then um, I'm sure we will have some more. Um, the first question was how uh, you expect the future trajectories of the war in Ukraine, um, i.e. whether Ukraine or Russia um, gains the upper hand, will affect Russian activities, especially in the Middle East and Africa. Um, the second question um, is about what we mean with Global South. We've all mentioned that this is a placeholder and not a concept, but uh, but because it is so diverse, maybe there are different approaches by Russia to different parts of the global south. Um, so do you see any difference in how Russia approaches Latin America, Africa, uh, Middle East and North Africa? And the third question um, are, is about the vectors of Russian influence uh, over public opinion in the global south, whether there are any media outlets or other tools that Russia is using. Um, I think with these three questions, we can already go back to our speakers. Um, you don't feel obliged to answer all the questions, but uh, you can pick and choose the ones you want to answer. Um, shall we start with you, Kadri? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, um, starting from the second question, maybe, um, I think Russia's approaches clearly are different uh, from region to region, even from country to country, uh, depending really on what it can offer. Um, you know, the African states that need security assistance uh, to the regime, Russia is relatively well placed to, to offer that. Even even now, uh, after Prigozhin's death, it still has structures that 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 can do that. Um, and so, yeah, in Africa's so-called cool belt, um, that that approach will likely be relevant. At the same time, if you look, for instance, at Asia Pacific. Um, I mean, I sometimes talk to people from, from the region and they have always pointed out that Russia is not a true regional power in Asia-Pacific Asia in the way that other countries 
would maybe like it to be, but Russia comes to those meetings with its sort of great power agenda, its focus on its relationship yeah, with China, America, whatever occupies it at the moment, but it lacks ideas and possibly even knowledge about the sort of true regional agenda in, in Asia Pacific. Um, because there, I mean, it's a huge region and they they have business of their own, but that's not that great power centric. So Russia clearly has uh, strengths and weaknesses, uh, region by region, but also topic by topic. When I was working on my paper, I um, I talked to a few people in Moscow as as well about how it looks to them and how the future looks. And one of them had that great quote um, that you know if. If the name of the game is security, then they will simply invent the new Brigosian. If the name of the game is uh, development, then Russia really has little to offer. And to him, it seemed that Russia will be, in a way, a deal taker rather than deal maker in, in, in those relationships. It will try to use these countries in its own interests and offer in return what it can, but on some occasions it, 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 it cannot. And um, that probably also uh, answers the first question, how Russia's behavior will change uh, if it wins in the war, if it loses. So I think even if it wins in the war, I, I don't think that it will be, yeah, I mean, first concept of winning is 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 vague. I will not go into it, but uh, that is, that's something to be, I mean, it's not so easy. But secondly, I think even so, it will be a constrained country in many ways, diminished power with fewer resources, um, also fewer resources by virtue of how it is structured. And you know, I have tried to look at, at, at how Russian diplomacy works and, and Soviet diplomacy has worked. And what I can see is that bottom-up initiative is is not encouraged it's ever less and that actually means that you know it's less creative than it than it could be and i think in all these regional relationships in the end it it it, it matters so i don't think that russia doing well on the battlefield will inevitably translate it into being uh, more powerful in uh, in all these other areas Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, let me come in here and um, slightly disagree with Kadri, not fully. I mean, I do fundamentally believe, and I'm addressing the first question in terms of Russian bandwidth, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, depending on trajectories in Ukraine. I do fundamentally agree with the notion that Russia will remain constrained whichever way the war in Ukraine goes. It will not suddenly emerge as a major security provider or let alone military player in other parts of the world, um, even if it gains the upper hand in Ukraine and some resources are being freed up. However, I do think that we still need to take whatever Russia can do in those regions very seriously. I mean, if you look at Russia's presence in the Middle East and Africa, it hasn't really suffered uh, over the last two years um, since the war in Ukraine began. I mean, Russia um, had to rotate some forces out of Syria. It initially handed some bases over to Iranian-backed forces, but there wasn't a significant uh, reduction in the Russian presence in Syria. And actually, I would argue Russia has been quite savvy taking different measures to ensure its continued influence in Syria. Division of labor with the Iranians, on the one hand, militarily, and then politically fostering normalization between the Assad government and the Arab states and Turkey in order to get some economic momentum, reconstruction funding, and perhaps investment into the Syrian economy over the medium to long term, the kind of funding that Russia itself cannot or does not want to provide to Syria. What we also see is that Russia, with its limited uh, resources, has moved somewhat closer to what we could call the axis of resistance in the Middle East, so Iran and affiliated actors who of course have an open aspiration to kick the United States out of the region and they are openly anti-Western actors. Um, and we see Russia on the margins, whether it's diplomatically and politically or militarily 
colluding more with those actors. Um, we now see since October 7th, Russia quite cynically adopting this pro-Palestinian posturing on the war in Gaza. Um, and again, here, a shielding of um, resistance actors, whether it's Hamas or the Houthis at the UN Security Council, but also welcoming these actors to Moscow. So I, I could see a situation where um, if, if, if some resources are being freed up, given the trajectory of in, in Ukraine, that we could see Russia somewhat stepping up the game again in the Middle East, not uh, emerging uh, in the way it did in Syria as a military player. But if you look at Russian discourse, they're already hinting that they want to do more in, in Iraq. And of course, Russia is agitating against the US presence in Iraq and says that that should end. I also think that Russia will continue to um, to engage with, with Iran and the axis of resistance. And it's already signaling that it's not willing to cede the diplomatic scene to the Americans um, and, and other actors when it comes to, quote unquote, the day after in Gaza and the broader region. The Russians hosted an intra-Palestinian meeting in Moscow last week. Now, not much came of that. And I really don't think it should be um, the importance should be over exaggerated. It's also clear, given the level of, at which it was held, that Russian diplomacy right now is not according a, a sort of priority to this issue. But it does signal that the Russians want to stay relevant, um, you know, as 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 uh, developments shake out in the region over over coming months, and they might have somewhat more bandwidth to do that. Similarly, in Africa, I mean, um, there was so much prognosis after Prigozhin was killed that Wagner would seat the scene in the Sahel, and that's not what has happened at all. What we're actually seeing is a, a reconfiguration and a rebranding of Wagner into the Africa Corps, held at, at a much tighter leash by the Ministry of Defense and, and the GRU, Foreign Military Intelligence. And, um, and those structures are there to stay in, in, in the Sahel, um, I think Africa Corps supported the Malian government in November in, in, in fighting against the rebels. It made an entry into Burkina Faso. There are concerns that it could emerge in, in Niger. So I don't see Russia as that kind of player going anywhere in the Sahel. And if anything, if you look at Libya, for example, where Russia is now talking about wanting access to a deep water port, the Russians are now actually, I think, um, becoming much more comfortable with the notion of official presence on the continent. You know, before the war in Ukraine, it was Wagner, it was about plausible deniability, it was all unofficial. And now um, with Africa Corps, and, and if we look at what's happening in Libya, there's a greater appetite and, and, and a greater willingness to sort of say we're here as, an, as official partners to these governments. And so I think, again, I agree with Kadri that there will be constraints in, in terms of how far Russia can go with this, but it's certainly something that we should be watching quite quite carefully. Ivan, your take. Yeah. Listen, uh, in my view, there is very important to distinguish two things, the Russian influence and the decline of Western influence. They're related, but they not explain easily each other. Uh, and from this point of view, I very much agree that Russia is going to be present and it will try to position itself at a low cost at the center of many things, because basically Russia has certain advantages. One is, by the way, between the Security Council. For many of these countries, this is quite important. Secondly, unlike countries like uh, China, Russia and Turkey are basically the only middle powers which are very eager to present and to project power outside of their borders. It's not by accident that in Libya, this is the countries that ended. You have Syria, you have other places. Uh, and from this point of view, they are basically providing services which are in demand that basically at the same time, the supply is very limited. Uh, not many kind of a countries have the political wills or capacity to send the type of a military uh, 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 unit that Wagner is going to provide. So from this point of view, they have a niche of their own, and as we know, niche is something that they stay. But what is much more important, in my view, to understanding the bigger strategy of Russia is that they're much more great in making negative coalitions. This was basically the failure of the French presence in Francophone Africa that is the biggest story. And in this story, basically, the Russians managed to get in and to play a role for themselves. But this was a kind of a using the situation that was not created by them. They managed very much to 
exploit this situation to put themselves on the map. But this is a process that started much earlier. And by the way, it's not about France or the colonial powers. He has this type of a stories. But as a result of it, what I do believe uh, is very important is that if Russia is going to be successful in Ukraine, this is going to hurt the political influence and the prestige of both United States and EU outside of their borders. Clear. Uh, we have been doing this opinion polls, and basically people who believe that Russia is going to prevail in Ukraine, and we're talking about public, not about leaders, uh, it basically in a much higher number of those who believe that in the next 20 years, European Union is not going to be around. So from this point of view, this is not only what you achieve, but also what kind of a reputational cost you're doing on the other side. Uh, and secondly, if basically Russia is going to be successful, at least in the eyes of, uh, 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 of many, regardless of how we are going to define success, listen, this is the way to influence. This is the way to project more. And while Russia is going to have constraints, particularly on the financial side, there's so much focused on the war in Ukraine. Around 30% of the Russian budgets now go to the war-related uh, expenses, which basically is a constraint. Uh, on the other side, you basically have a certain type of symbolic politics. And one of the things that made a strong impression on me when we had been doing uh, this global survey, and it was already in the autumn when Avdivka was not uh, under Russian control and so on, People did not see these two years of war, which in my view, Russia really had a lot of losses and kind of, uh, they the uh, um, very strong Russian army was uh, very much put on the questions. This is not the way people outside of the West see it because they believe that Russia is fighting the West. And losing to the West is not something that is humiliating. Uh, and for me, this is, part of the story. What we are seeing at this moment, I don't expect, I don't believe that Russia is going to be the biggest beneficiaries when it comes to influence in this situation. It's not only China, but even countries like Turkey or even Brazil, Saudi Arabia for sure, are going much more to use this in order to, uh, to strengthen their influence outside of their borders. But one thing is very clear, Russia's success is going to make it very difficult for both the United States and particularly for the European Union to come with an any activist agenda, particularly keeping in mind that all our own publics, and this is very strong in the United States, has this isolationist move, asking these questions, what we're doing there, yeah? what we really want to achieve. So uh, from this point of view, they position themselves as the major enemy of the West. And this gives you symbolic victories, even when kind of the real material victory is not always there. Thank you, Ivan. Can I go back to you with two more questions which are related to what you just said? Um, one is uh, about, well, it's a sort of symmetric question to the one you just answered. Um, how is this competition for the Global South going to influence or not the outcome of the war? So that's the one. Um, and the second question is, whether some countries in the West and in the EU specifically mm -hmm. may be better placed to reach out to countries in the South. That's something we hear often in, in a place like Paris, for example, where the idea that France with its colonial um, heritage is not very well placed to explain to African countries what's going on uh, in Ukraine, but that countries that lived under Soviet uh, domination may may have better arguments to make. Um, so yeah, these are the two next questions. And I'd be happy to hear also um, what Hannah and Kadri, if you want to elaborate on these. And it, it's really difficult because the war more and more is going to become a regional war. Uh, as a result of it, there are going to be less and less kind of a global response to things happening on the ground. Yes, there are going to be conferences and countries like Saudi Arabia or others are going to be interesting to mediate in Turkey for sure. Uh, but as I said, the war in uh, Gaza has a much bigger global dimension for things that uh, are difficult to discuss. But one of them is also that uh, the anti-colonial kind of a decolonization narrative resonated with these countries much more than the Cold War narrative. And this is the things that we see. Secondly, the other thing that is also going to affect very much what is happening is that in uh, Europe, we're going to have 
And we have a lot of people coming from Ukraine as a result of the war. And their presence also is going to keep the conversation very strong in our societies because diasporas are very important of how you're reacting. One of the reasons that, for example, countries like Chile or Brazil have been so much interested in the Middle East is because of the size of the diaspora coming from these countries. Uh, so uh, as a result of it, uh, uh, in my view, we're going to see a major prefiguration and uh, as a result of this war, both particularly the European Union and Russia are going to be much more Europe-centered than they want it to be. Because for European Union, basically what is happening in Ukraine, I really believe is kind of an existential importance. On the other side, it's about resources. Uh, you don't have money for everything. So of course, part of the money that you're going to give to Ukraine are going to be also out of the money that otherwise you can have for development projects and things like this. And of course, there is a problem with the colonial powers. Uh, but here's the interesting story. Small countries, East European countries, which does not have a colonial history, can be successful in the initiative like the Czech initiative. But on the other side, let's be also open. We do not have part of the expertise that you have that comes from your colonial legacy. Uh, in order to be successful in many of these countries means that you should have people that have been working there, that were living there, and by the way, having diasporas from these countries, which are producing certain knowledge from this point of view, countries like be it France or Spain when it comes to Latin America, or Portugal when it comes to Brazil, uh, in a certain way, a much more better position to know that the other society and to be connected to it. Uh, and for East Europeans, it's also not easy because for many of us, who not simply that we do not have a colonial history, we have been on the other side of the colonial debate. Listen, I'm Bulgarian. For 500 years, part of the Ottoman Empire. Not easy to convince me about my colonial guilt. Uh, and as a result of it, this is going to push a very much kind of a pressure within the European Union, how to reconcile the post-imperial and the anti-imperial legacies of the different countries. Uh, and this is important, and uh, the size of the countries also matters. And here the European Union as kind of a collective player is also kind of going to be in a much more difficult position because there is one thing that uh, for the moment European Union uh, is uh, not doing is that its foreign policy was very much reduced to the problem of trade uh, and uh, the, the hard, power, hard power is not part of the conversation in the world in which hard power is there. And secondly, if we decided to develop a much more strong defense identity, which means that you're going to see certain type of a much more protectionist policies that go in certain areas, which I have the feeling that most of the European countries are going to agree with. So first, I very much agree it's not going to be a global south is going to decide what kind of country, what kind of regions, in what kind of period are critically important for us. Uh, and as I said, Russia and Mario really can lose India, which was very important for them. And by the way, the Indians were fighting because of their relations with China. They really wanted Russia on the table, but uh, developing their relations with the United States, they less and less basically have a space for Russia in this. But Europe does not have any specific relations on this. On the Middle East, it's not going to be easy for us. And it's not going to be easy because while to a certain extent the war in Ukraine created certain type of a unity on the European side, the war in Gaza basically divided European societies a lot. And also the generational divide is dramatic. And also East-West uh, divide is uh, dramatic. Basically, East Europeans has a much less interest in what is happening in the Middle East and uh, things like this. So I do believe all this is there. They're not going to be one policy, but they should be a decision. And in my view, the idea is who is going to do what. And I'm again going back to the Czech initiative because this kind of a small initiative can be done by different countries. You can have a Portuguese initiative on certain things related to Brazil. You can have uh, uh, other initiatives, but they should be a common coordination why we're doing this and what we want to achieve in five, in 10 years period. Thanks a lot. Hannah, do you want to elaborate on some of the points uh, that were raised? I mean, it's hard to follow Ivan after such an excellent and comprehensive response. But I mean, I, I broadly agree with him that the global south is not going to be the decisive factor when it comes to 
the further trajectory of the war in Ukraine. I think if, if it was already a tall order to frame this war as decisive for a rules-based international order at the beginning of the war, it's now essentially become impossible with events in Gaza to make that case to countries of the global south. You know, I do think there is value to keep um, making sure that the support that the Russian war machine gets from different parts of the global south remains somewhat constrained. I mean, there are sanctions, there are export controls, there are sort of ways to to limit, you know, the support that Russia can get. And I don't think that's an unimportant effort, but I think we also have to recognize the limitations of it and that it will always be highly imperfect because countries that are sanctioned, you know, like Russia, Iran, and North Korea will find ways to work around that. So it will always be a highly imperfect effort. But what it basically means is that I think instead of trying to convince diplomats from global South countries uh, you know, to adopt another position on Russia or the war in Ukraine, the focus should be much more to make sure that we in Europe recognize what is at stake and remain united on the issue and 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 uh, provide Ukraine with support. That is, I think, really where the, the, the political and diplomatic uh, uh, focus uh, needs to be. Um, you know, I think um, it was always a tall order to to convince countries in the global south um, that this war was different from others and had you know had certain um, import for the future of global order for many of the things that have been discussed already uh, among us um, the perception of double standards and hypocrisy by Western states the notion that we care more about certain conflicts than about others. I think the fact that in, in some parts of the global south, particularly in Africa, Russia is still seen, you know, the Soviet Union is still seen as supportive of the anti-colonial struggles of these countries. And that is something that still really resonates, has also not helped Ukraine's cause uh, to make the case to Africa that it itself is now fighting an anti-colonial struggle against, against Russia. I think it was always somewhat um, interesting to me why that argument didn't seem to, to resonate more. But I think it's it's because of how Russia slash the Soviet Union was is still seen in, in that part of the world and that perhaps not much of a differentiation is being made between Ukraine and Russia and other successor states of the, of the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, so those those are perhaps the points I would I would like to add. Well, we can make one sentence because the more we are pressing them with the moral arguments, the more they're going to be a backlash. Uh, it's difficult for me to prove, but I do believe that some of the reason the South Africa decided to put the Israelis to the International Criminal Court was also the pressure that we put on them of Putin not attending the BRICS meeting. They said, if you want so much to play in the rules game, so be ready for it. And I do believe we're going to see more of it. Thanks for that important point. Um, and I would have questions to what you said, Hannah, but before that, Kateri, um, you want to come in? Um, no, just one small thing to add. I I have been really worried about yeah how the EU adapts to that new and more transactional era, um, partly uh, for reasons that Ivan mentioned, um, different countries experience equips us very differently to deal with it and I, mean, I spend a lot of time in Estonia these days and I it seems to me that some some parts of Eastern Europe or maybe maybe also some parts of Northern Europe I mean I don't think there is understanding that sort of end of history moment is has passed I I think at least for parts of Eastern Europe, it's really hard to grasp because many of these countries were not really among the shapers of the post-Cold War order, but they were among major beneficiaries of it. And it's become viewed as a kind of God-given uh, state of affairs that, that needs to be restored uh, by moralizing to a large extent. and. Even if they understand that this is maybe not working in a perfect way, it's very hard to somehow let go of it because 
that is that rose country's historical experience uh moralizing uh, and you know naming and shaming worked in in struggle for independence or or getting rid of soviet domination in in the 1990s that is still very much in in political psyche uh of of these nations and i i am a bit worried uh that the risk might not be sort of ideal preparation for to deal with the problems that are going to come over the next decade and, and two. Thank you, Kadri. Um, I'd like maybe to come back to the question of narratives, because we said at the, I think you said, Kadri, at the beginning that it's not a question of narratives, but at the same time, um, we have to manage a war of narratives that Russia is creating on this colonial issue by managing to blur the fact that Russia has its own imperial legacy and has been a colonial power in a way, uh, but also on the issue of sanctions that you mentioned, Hannah. Um, the fact that um, we need to make sure sanctions are as well implemented as possible, while at the same time Russia is spreading the narrative that a number of issues that um, countries of the South have to deal with are, are a direct consequence of, um, of Western sanctions. So without making it a war of narratives, how do we deal with these challenges that Russia is creating for our own policies? Um, I don't know who wants to start on this. Um, shall I get back to you, Kadri? And maybe because we are getting closer to the end of our webinar, um, if you want to add some, well, your final takeaways or some um, final remarks, please do. Yeah, on narratives, I don't, I'm skeptical. I. I feel that you know we can we can get bogged down in, in into that fight of narratives and and that is not ultimately very fruitful. In Russia, can change its narrative every second day, uh, and and these become can become so twisted. And you know if we if we go along the wall of that, uh, trying to debunk all of that, then actually we in a way are sort of magnifying Russia's uh, Russia's narrative just by 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 engaging with it so I think it is much more important to devise our own policies and 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 try to actually do something as opposed uh, to investing a lot of energy into talking and and debunking what Russia is 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 telling uh, others I mean many people think that this is what matters. I, I've always been a bit skeptical on that account. Anna, do you want to come in? Yeah, so just two quick thoughts on this. I mean, the first thing I think that's important to do is to differentiate between Russian narratives and Russian disinformation. I feel like we've seen this tendency over the last two years to call anything that comes out of Russia disinformation, it's disinformation, you know, um, which, you know, sometimes is the case if you look at the kinds of things that Russia has said about Ukraine, I don't know, experimenting with biological weapons or nuclear weapons or radiological weapons or whichever weapons of mass destruction you can come up with or certain, you know, facts on the ground in the war. Those are lies, you know, those are factually wrong and they should be called out as disinformation. But Russia's way to look at certain processes or things or conflicts in the world in presenting narratives on that that also happen to resonate uh, widely in the global south to sort of give it the stamp of Russian disinformation, I don't think has served us very well. So I do think it would be important to make that kind of um, that kind of differentiation. I, I do agree with Kadri that I'm not sure how much um, engaging in a in a better war of narrative narratives with Russia serves as well. You know, I, I was sort of struck when I when I um, 
I, I moderated an event with two very accomplished journalists working for major Western outlets some six months into the war. And I sort of asked them, you know, Russia presents a narrative on what is happening on the ground, often very, very fast and sort of dominates the information space. How do you as journalists who do due diligence and who collect their facts, how do you deal with this sort of Russian antagonist in the information space? And I thought the, the answer I got was very, very interesting. You know, one of them said, look, I haven't met a single person who has changed their view on this conflict, on the war in Ukraine or on Russia for that matter, since the war began and sort of based on our reporting. I don't think that is possible to achieve with my reporting. So what I want to do with my work is present good journalism to those who read our paper and want to be informed, you know, but I don't see it as my mission or as my even within the realm of my, you know, possibility for me to, to change around those who have a fundamentally different view on Russia or on this war, because it's not operating on the basis of factual reporting. The reason why these individuals have a different view of what's going on resonates, you know, it's happening at a, a deeper level, and I cannot change that through my reporting, which leads me to sort of my final conclusion on this, which is that I don't think we will bring people around in the global south or in our own societies for that matter on russia or the war in ukraine by engaging in some narrative war it's actually just leading by example and living up to our own standards that we sort of claim to to stand for um, and whether that's in related to the war in gaza or other conflicts around the world actually leading by example is going to do so much more than presenting some sort of argument about a rules-based international order we actually have to live by it and that's i think the only thing that will that will change views yeah we probably have to adapt to the idea that facts cannot change opinions anymore which is quite a scary one um ivan your final remarks yeah i'll be very brief because i'm in agreement first the idea that they can be a kind of an abstract anti-imperial solidarity is not kind of supported by the facts. In a certain way, to believe that we can make people see Russia as the kind of a most imperial of the empires, it's possible only in Eastern Europe and in the post-Soviet space where basically this imperial presence was real. But for people outside of Europe, of course, they're going to remember the old European colonial empires. And of course, America is the superpower. And from this point of view, when they talk about the empire in many of these places, they're going to mean the United States. And this is the story. So in a certain way, Russia was not creating a narrative. Russia was simply was subscribing to a narrative that was already there before and being used by all the actors, basically. Uh, uh, of course, they have a much better position from the media, other point of view, much bigger budgets to do this. But this is not a new narrative. They simply subscribe for the narrative and even the new global majority and so on is not something that is invented by the Russians. And the second important issue is the economic sanctions. Because one of the resistance is about sanctions and not simply sanctions because they hurt some countries and we remember the story with the food and the fertilizers in Africa. The problem is that the West is blamed for weaponizing its critical position in the global infrastructure. It's not about solidarity with Russia. I don't believe that many of these countries care about what is happening in Russia. I don't believe that we had an option not to have sanctions, let's be on this. But the problem with sanctions is that they hurt, but they don't kill. And personally, always I have a problem with the weapons that hurt, but do not kill. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have any more questions. So it. I just have to thank our audience for their attention and for the very good questions that were asked. And to thank our speakers uh, for very insightful presentation and what I found was quite a fascinating mm -hmm. discussion. Uh, not a conclusive one, I suspect, but um, but I hope we will have many more discussions on that topic um, and come up with um, with in creative policy recommendations. So thanks again and um, yeah, see you soon.